Right. Um, so um, our talk is about restoring the River Trent and um, its background, how it's changed over um, the number of years and what we're doing um, to uh, restore it for wildlife. So um, me, um, I'm the Living Floodplains Officer uh, working on the Living Floodplains Project, which, which is one of the natural heritage projects uh, for the um, Transforming the Trent Valley Scheme. And Nick, I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about your role. Hello, yes, so I'm a, a freshwater ecologist with Staffordshire Wildlife Trust. I've been with the Trust for a number of years and um, yeah, really looking forward to uh, running you guys through some of the schemes that we've been involved with and then taking a look ahead as well to see what could be possible in the future. Thank you. Um, right, so I'll just give you, I know, I know that Steve's already given you a brief overview of the project area, but um, just as a refresher, I've also got a map as well. So um, here you can see in the paler blue is the scheme area. Um, the, the, the dark uh, blobs on the map uh, denote where the major towns and um, uh, villages are uh, throughout the, the project area. And as you can see, you've got um, the River Dove uh, coming down here. You've got the River Trent in the project area and also um, the River Tame as we move uh, south towards Tamworth, um, which is not quite in the scheme area, but um, it, it connects to that there. Um, so uh, this project predominantly, um, it's, a, it's a project area that um, we're celebrating the rivers and its floodplains and uh, looking at how we can connect back with them, both um, in, in terms of uh, enjoyment uh, from people's side of things, but also in particular from my point of view for um, wildlife. Um, this project area, of course, um, is just a jigsaw piece in the wider puzzle. Um, it connects to other projects that are going on. Um, so you've got uh, across in Stoke-on-Trent, there's the Sunrise Project, which is doing uh, similar things along uh, the River Trent in that section there. You've got uh, Stafford Brooks project as well um, in Stafford itself. And then further out of the county in Derbyshire, there's, um, uh, there's projects up there where they're looking um, to do things along further up the River Trent there and all the way over into Nottingham um, and that area as well. So basically we're just trying to um, piece together all of these projects so we have a, an area of connectivity along the, um, the, the, these major river networks. Um, if I just pass over to Nick, he'll tell you a little bit more about um, the importance of this, um, this connectivity side of things. Thanks, Victoria. Yeah, so the plan this evening is for me to um, do, do a chunk. We're gonna do a double act together, Victoria and I, uh, and just see how it goes. Um, but the, the overall ambition for the, for the project is, is, as Victoria says, is to fit in as a jigsaw piece within this source to sea project. So we are looking to recreate one of Britain's great wetlands uh, for wildlife and people. And this, is, this isn't gonna happen uh, particularly quickly. Um, what we wanted to show you in the first part of the talk is what's happened over the last 25 years or so and, and the historical background to it. And then some of the plans that we have uh, coming up into the future. Uh, next slide please. So it has been suggested that um, the River Trent is a very special river within the U UK context. Um, it, has been, um, it has been likened, it has been uh, compared to the mighty Mississippi in terms of its characteristics. So um, experts from uh, geomorphologists have, have suggested that it's um, because of its character to uh, meander to braid and that, that means it splits up into a, a series of different channels and evolves so it just changes course very very quickly. Um, this, this can happen on the trend as well, it can even happen to this, to this day. The pictures that, are, that we're showing you here, um, the picture on the left is something that's happened very recently at Barton Quarry right in the centre of the project area and during a flood event water spilled out from the main channel and it actually washed over the floodplain 
and started eating down into the gravel deposits. So these are gravel deposits that have been laid down after the last glaciation, um, a real depth of, of gravel there. And when the river washes over the, the, the floodplain surface, it eats down and generates loads of habitats. The right hand picture, which isn't very clear, but you can see the, um, the trend at the bottom of the slide. And then Victoria's pointing out the, um, this, this scour channel as it's gone over a maize field and eaten down into the, into the gravels. So I think the, the takeaway message here is that given a chance, um, the river can be unshackled. And it, it is very, it's very exciting that it can actually recreate these habitats. It can uh, move away from being a single thread channel to create a, a series of multiple channels and oxbows and floodplain scour um, pools, ponds, and all sorts of good stuff too. Here's a lovely example of a, of a messy bit of habitat at the very top end of the, the scheme. So this is at uh, Colwich, um, just, just near Rugeley. And here the river has done it by itself. It's quite unusual on the trend that it can do this. But um, on this particular occasion, it's broken free and you've got drifting trees that come down the river during floods. They lodge down into the shallow water and start creating islands. You've got um, little beaches that form got eroding cliffs on the very far side, um, eating into a, an area of woodland. And this is, this is a sort of vision of what we'd love to see more of. Um, and if we can't, if the river can't do it by itself, um, it may take us to come in and do interventions to, to help restore the river and its floodplain naturally. So if we can move on to the next slide. There are some additional reference conditions. So these are areas that inspire us, um, so it's what the river really should look like in terms of its habitats uh, along the river corridor. This is the lower dove, just upstream of the A38. And I'll show you some, some aerial pictures in a minute. Um, but again, just really messy, scruffy habitats, very dynamic. Um, you've got these areas of uh, timber jams that are, that are forming on the sides of the rivers. Um, you've got some um, heaps of gravel that are being sorted by the river during high flow events and being dumped <laughs> as, as beaches and, and shingle bars. Um, and then on the right hand slide, they can see an area of riverine woodland, uh, wet woodland, that's increasing in size over time. The, the pictures um, of the um, creatures below, so the, the, um, the invertebrate there, is a river saucer bug. And this is the only place in the river trend system that we found this species is on this section of the lower dove. It's a real indicator of um, good water quality and good, uh, good habitats. So the fact that it's there is, is very encouraging. What we'd love to see is for it to spread into other habitats and other sections of river as they become restored and the water quality improves correspondingly. Um, in terms of salmon, they've been successfully reintroduced to the Trent system and the dove is their main spawning area uh, as it is at the moment. And this particular bit of habitat here is very important for salmon as, as they're coming up and migrating from the, from the sea up through the estuary, up the rivers. Um, they need places to stop off and, and um, rest. And this is a good example of that. So the, the two, the sequence here is from 2003 and the next slide is 2010. And it just shows how the river has changed over that seven year period. And we've calculated that the river was able to migrate up to, up to 70 meters during this time. So obviously an average of 10 meters per year, which is really on a par with you know, any, any um, active Scottish river that you might come across. So for this to be happening in the, in the Trent catchment is, is really exciting. And, uh, as we'll be hearing later from Victoria, just upstream from here, there's a very large weir that's recently been taken out. And we should see more of this, this type of active, um, you know, floodplain development and, and river migration over time. Just, to, just, just as a point there, um, this road down here, so you've got a bit of a reference point, is the A38, um, just on the northern side of Burton there. So um, just to give you a reference of where you are, and this is the river dove coming under the A38 there. That's a fantastic bit of river. Okay, yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. So just looking at the, the context for us, the, the historical context, um, the, the Trent is obviously one of our great rivers in, in England. Um, and in the past, as, as we've been describing, we've been, we've been uh, comparing it to the mighty Mississippi. 
there are still places where you can see these split channels. Burton upon Trent is a good example. If you go to the washlands there, you can still see the rivers running through two or three different channels at once. But in the past, it would have, it would have run right away through the floodplain. It would have been running uh, in a series of different channels there. Uh, next slide, please. And to, to, to really put it into context, um, unusually for Europe, um, the, the River Trent and the River Tame uh, both have their headwaters that have been overtaken um, by massive conurbation. So the top of the Trent, the headwaters of the, the Trent, you have Stoke-on-Trent and the, and the Potteries. And with the Tame, you have Birmingham and the Black Country. And it's a really, really rough start in life for these two rivers. And, and, and it's really knocked us back. So we have a situation now where we've pretty much turned our backs on the river. Um, we've, we've plumbed in all our accumulated filth, all our sewage, all our um, urban runoff into these, into these rivers. And we've completely turned our backs on them. Um, so there's a big job to do to, to sort of turn that aspect of it around. Um, so we ended up with a situation where we effectively had a dead river, biologically dead. There was no life in the River Trent um, during this time, right up until the end of the 1970s, early 1980s, when for the first time sewage fungus was found um, in, in the River Tame. So it's, it was the first sign of life in the river. And I hope you'll, hope you'll appreciate as we go through the slides how much the river has come back. Given a chance, um, it, it really can come back over time. Next slide, please. So to add insult to injury, not only did we um, pour all our filth into these rivers, but we engineered them. Um, we made them straight-sided, we deepened them, we narrowed them, we turned them into canal-like features. And we lost, uh, a lot of the trees were taken out uh, along the rivers as well. And so the idea was to stop them flooding onto, uh, onto, the, onto the associated floodplain. The left-hand picture here is, as I understand it, from about 1947. And it's the Trent Catchment River Board doing some um, basically dredging. Uh, but they really, they really did quite an engineering job here. They actually set up a railway. You can just about make out the railway cart in the, in the background there with the, the drag line dropping the gravel into it. The gravel was taken away for road building, and house building, uh, things like that. Um, you might also be able to make out there's a, a massive tree next to the drag line there as well. So all the, the adjacent bankside trees were removed as well and, and the river was lowered. Um, the right hand slide you can see here is actually at the, what is now the National Memorial Arboretum. And it's the River Tame just before it joins the River Trent. On the other side here, we have Croxall, Croxall Nature Reserve, but it really does show up how um, the river, even after you know, 100 years, it, it barely changed. They, they, we describe it as being fossilized. The river, the river has been so heavily modified and so heavily engineered that it's never ever going to change. Um, it's a self-cleansing channel. So in these particular instances, you really do need to come in and do your restoration schemes um, to do these interventions to, to, to get the, the river restoring its own habitats. Next slide, please. So it's all a bit doom and gloom. Um, a lot of the original character of this particular part of the Transforming the Trent Valley project area has been deleted, but you can look for clues in the landscape. And um, the, the first one here is uh, a picture of a woolly rhino that was found at Whitemore Hay Quarry back in the mid to late 1990s. And uh, what's lovely is the, um, when you look at place names, obviously we had, used to have Drake Low Power Station up on the upper uh, river terraces of the River Trent. And we, we understand that uh, the place name refers to when, when they found these remains, they probably thought that they were finding dragons, uh, dragon remains in, in, the, in the gravels, and uh, hence, the, hence the place name. I, I struggle to pronounce this, and I've, I've been working here for over 20 years, but uh, Alruwas, how do you say it, Victoria? Alruwas? Alruwas, I thought, I don't know. <laughs> But the Old English, that means a uh, place of the older swamp. So again, gives you a clue to what that used to look like in the sort of pre-Neolithic, uh, before a lot of these, um, the, these floodplain forests were removed. Home, as, as we'll be picking up on in, in the later slides, is a name for a river island. 
Ridware is, is a place where a ford, um, where, where, where the river is forded and, and people often have settlements nearby. Catton, Catton Hall, Catton Farm um, could, could possibly refer to a place where there used to be wildcats, which is quite a, quite a, quite a thought. And Willington, um, the name there refers to Willow. So if you've, if you've got any others, I mean, there's just a few examples from the project area, but so we'd love to hear if you've got any others, um, please, please get in touch with the project and, and let's hear about them. Thanks. That'd be interesting one for the cultural heritage um, project uh, that Rod's doing, um, linking to some of the uh, place names and history of uh, the River Valley. Yeah, that'd be good. So what are we doing about it? Um, here's one of the first projects that, that, that was done um, on, on the River Tame. So this is what used to be Middleton Hall and Dost Hill Quarries, and that's Tamworth in, in the background there. Um, a major river restoration project was undertaken by Hanson Aggregates. Um, this is all uh, a large quarry. And it does look a bit strange. When you, when you look at the aerial photograph, um, this project was done in 1998. And the idea was to allow the gravel, the gravel company to come in and ex extract the sand and gravel from that, um, from that edge of the river and to widen it out, make it double its width, and then leave a series of river islands down the middle. But, uh, at the time were referred to as canal boats, <laughs> uh, but it, it worked. And, and what we'll show you is with the um, aerial pictures later on, you should see how well it's worked over time. Um, yeah, thanks, Victoria. Yeah. So when you actually go down and have a look at uh, how the river's been widened out and the resulting habitats, it's just absolutely fantastic. Considering that this used to be, you know, a, a biologically dead river, it's now becoming abundant with certain types of life. And we've given a few examples there around the edge. Um, you've got bivalves, you've got river mussels that are now doing pretty well in, in some of those um, shallows and, and, and edges. Um, you've got otters that are now breeding. Kingsby Water Park is a particularly good place for them, but they're all the way through the Tame and the Trent and the Gulf now setting up territories using these gravel pits and the rivers and canals as part of those territories. Um, you can see areas of, of, of mud there and, and it's a bare shingle. So you have waders such as oyster catcher and snipe that come in and, and forage in these areas. And it even potentially throws a lifeline to really rare, threatened and elusive species, such as the white court crayfish, um, which, which is living in some of the tributaries nearby and the elusive water shrew that you can see there that, that obviously uh, dives down into the water and scoffs um, freshwater invertebrates like mayflies and caddis. Yes, Excellent. yeah. It's really this variety of um, different habitats, isn't it, here, that's um, enabling um, all the different variety of life to come back. It, it's perfect. I mean, it, you, you could have things like you know, sand martins, nesting in those cliffs, hingfishers, solitary bees and wasps. You know, we could spend a whole talk just, just taking you through that one slide. But here with the aerial photographs, you can see that um, line of canal boats. So this is um, in 2003 again, so that the, the original First phase of the work was done in 1998, so you can see how it's um, naturalizing over time. And then just seven years later, so this is 2010, you can just see how you've got wet woodlands, you've got areas of shingle, you've got, um, you've got areas of, of um, mud and, and uh, backwaters forming there as well. You can also see at the top of the slide that another phase of work was done. So there was a, another section that was done in 2005 on the river that added up to almost two kilometers of river restoration, which has really been the inspiration for a lot of the work that we'll be talking about later on. So here are some of the other examples. Um, this is a section of the River Trent uh, from the Derbyshire side at Catton Hall called the Rylands Reach. And here is a very, very straight section. Um, it had been reinforced with limestone. And again, the river had just been completely fossilized. It, it wasn't um, recreating any particular habitats. So major surgery was required. We came in in 2012, I think it was, and we took out, reprofiled the whole of that bank. And what we found underneath was great because it was all the, the surplus gravels and, and sand that had been taken out of the river. The stuff that hadn't been used for road building and for housing had just been banked up on the side of the, the river there and left. 
And so we were able just to take the skin off, take the, take the brass off, and then all the other gravel was screened, um, so it was graded, um, took out all the fine particles that was taken away to farmland. All the rest of it was able to go back into the river where it belongs. So something like five, 6,000 uh, cubic meters of, of gravel was put back into the river, which, which was very exciting. And we were able to be quite imaginative about some of the features that we did along the straight, straight edge, just to kind of break it up a little bit. And that, believe it or not, that um, right-hand slide there is actually just a few days after we've done um, some of the shoot channels next to one of the river islands that I'll be talking about in just a, a second. So what we do is we mimic natural processes. Um, there aren't many examples, but there's one or two areas where um, you will see river islands naturally reforming on the trends. And how it happens is that you have willow that will drift down the, the river and occasionally it will actually lodge up on some shallow parts of the river. And if it's there long enough, it can send down roots into the, the base of the river, into the substrate of the river and start growing. And this is exactly what's happened here. This is opposite the uh, Memorial Arboretum uh, between there and Barton Quarry. And this river developed over about a 15 year period and just got bigger and bigger and bigger as, as the willow grew. And as you can see there, you, you'll have, as a result, um, the water will slow down in front of the river island and you'll get gravels and mud and sand dropping out in front as, as additional habitat. And you'll have the same thing downstream as well, just, just immediately downstream will get um, deposits. So the island just gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time, which, which is great to see. So when we're doing our restoration schemes, if we go on to the next slide, please, Victoria. Uh, we mimic that process. It looks a little bit brutal, but uh, the first thing you do is to uproot um, some donor willow trees. And the, the way that um, willows drift naturally down a river would be with the root plate facing upstream. So you align that into the river. And what we do is we pin it down with a digger and put the, put the willow tree with the root plate facing upstream and then put a load of these gravels uh, on top just to hold it in, in place and give it a chance to grow. And then the, the right hand picture there is just showing the, the shoot channel between the, uh, the, river, the new river island, the new channel bar, and we've put a what we call a kicker tree on, on the side of the, the river there as well just to, to provide some extra habitat and, and uh, hopefully you'll get things like backwaters forming behind that kicker tree too and it speeds up the water as it comes between the new mid-channel bar, the new developing island, and this um, habitat on the side. Fantastic habitat for fish and invertebrates in that particular instance. So this is another example of river widening, but here we had a go at one of our own nature reserves. This is Croxall Nature Reserve, um, just at the confluence of three major rivers. So you've got the, the Tame, that comes north from, from Birmingham and the Black Country. You've got the River Trent that it joins, and then you've also got the River Meese, which drains a part of the um, South Derbyshire and Northwest Leicestershire, and then comes into this part of East Staffordshire at, at, at Croxall. And this is what it was like before we did the work. It was actually, considering it was a nature reserve uh, and a former quarry, it was pretty poor habitat. Um, you know, really not much going on there in terms of you know, botanical richness or, or, or species abundance. So we, again, did major, major surgery on the river. We um, took out something like 43,000 cubic meters of soil. Um, some of the gravels were retained and put back into the edges of the river. All the rest were taken away to lake deposition sites that, that you'll see a bit later on in the aerial pictures. Uh, and then you'll just see the sequence there showing how we're stripping back the, from the edge of the river and lowering and, and reconnecting this part of the floodplain. Okay, so if we go on to the next slide, this, this kind of tells the story beautifully really. So uh, this was uh, before we did the scheme, uh, which was undertaken in 2009, completed in 2010. And then this is taken just after. So this was taken in the summer of 2010, just probably two or three months after we'd completed our scheme. Yeah, very. <laughs> it's pretty cool, right? <laughs> Uh, we, we were able to um, pull the river back up to about 100 metres opposite the confluence with the, with the Trent. It's funny, the, the Trent there actually looks like a smaller river, 
I think in terms of discharge, the Tame is often the uh, slightly bigger river on this occasion. But yeah, it, it was a very experimental project. Um, you can see the lake deposition sites as well. There was a one in that shallow lake there that Victoria's pointing out, and a much larger one in a, in a deep lake. It's probably like six six meters deep that one. So uh, most of the spoil went into that lake to create reed beds and shallows for, for uh, marginal habitats. Okay, that's Croxall. Um, thanks, Nick. Um, so um, it, it, it's just extremely important. This work would be for nothing really if we weren't um, basically monitoring what we're doing and, and looking at that research and um, sharing that information with the wider uh, river restoration community, which extends not just across um, the UK, but also into Europe as well. So we're always sharing um, different ideas on, on, um, and findings on our restoration plans. So what you can see here is a, what's called a digital terrain model. And basically it's um, uh, imagery or basically um, showing the terrain of the new area created at Croxall that Nick was just talking about um, underneath the surface of the water. So to do this, it's, it's done with a combination of using um, drones taking aerial photography. And also we've got the science team here um, using laser technology to um, get that detail out, what, showing exactly what's going on beneath the surface there. Um, this um, information is um, important because it firstly gives us um, a uh, idea of um, what the baseline condition is uh, after we've done the initial uh, creation work. So we know what's there as a, as a reference. Um, we, we can then go back and uh, study this area and look at how it's changed. So we could go back and do another um, survey uh, using um, scanning technology again um, and see if any of that structure's changed. Um, what we're looking at is to see whether any of um, the, the, the natural river processes have been kick-started uh, by this work that we've done. So we'll be looking for changes in um, the, the, the water flow, uh, the flow dynamics in the watercourse itself, uh, changes in the deposition rates, um, uh, looking to see if it's altered uh, where the river is uh, depositing river gravels and whether it's encouraging uh, further deposition as a result of um, uh, creating this uh, feature. Um, so we can kind of understand the overall success of the project um, in years to come. And we can also understand um, whether we want to change anything in the future as well. So um, the other thing about this, um, this model is once you've got this kind of um, image that's being created, you can then feed it into your computer system and um, you can model all sorts of things on that. Um, so based on uh, different uh, flows of water, you can then predict what's going to happen as a result of the shape of that water course now. So it's all really important information. Um, yeah, so uh, absolutely crucial to understanding uh, the future of uh, river restoration, really. Um, just uh, as a quick note also, um, this, uh, this uh, river restoration project itself ended up being a finalist in the European River Prize, uh, which is pretty fantastic for Staffordshire Wildlife Trust to be involved with that. So pretty amazing work, really. Still on Croxall here. Um, this is a photograph taken roughly two months, is that right, after the completion of the project? Um, just showing some of those shallows with those um, little islands that were created, the gravel islands with uh, the, the, the muddy um, sides. Um, uh, they'll start to vegetate over time, but this is how um, it looked initially. And you've got those shallows. Um, so what's really, really important and what we're, we're looking at is to create recovery up through the food chain. So we're really focusing on those um, different um, creatures, those invertebrates and fish 
um, that you see right at the base of the food chain here. And these are the kind of habitats that you'll, you'll find them in that, that are so missing from the trend at the moment. So um, just as a bit of an idea of uh, what we've got here, uh, this is a, a crane fly. It doesn't have a common name, um, but Tipula lateralis um, it's called. And then you've got spine gloach and stickleback just here. Um, in the bottom right hand corner, it's, this is the green drake mayfly. You've got a shingle beetle, very specific to these um, shingle and gravel areas um, here. And then um, a bullhead in the top right hand corner. Um, so yeah, um, the, the really important thing here is that we're creating lots of these um, new niches uh, on, on the trend, um, trying to encourage these uh, uh, species back that really survive at the, at the bottom of the food chain and then hopefully we'll see that restoration all the way up. Um, basically um, a lot of people are attracted to the uh, floodplains uh, looking uh, for some of these uh, top of the food chain species so um, just as an idea there you've got kingfisher, you've got um, uh, heron here, you've got barn owl, reed bunting, uh, snipe and lapwing and these are very iconic species that we all kind of like to um, associate with our floodplains but um, these species really rely on on the base of the uh, food chain so working from the bottom up is is how, how we try to play it. Um, this is um, at Chuckles Home. Uh, this is one of uh, Staffordshire Wildlife Trust nature reserves. It was formerly an active quarry and we had a fabulous opportunity to um, uh, purchase the uh, former quarry. Um, and um, just going back to that name again, um, home, uh, Chuckles Home. So from the previous slide, uh, we, we, we said that home is the name for a river island. Now, Tuckles Home itself was a giant uh, river island formerly on, on, the, on the trend there. And um, what we wanted to do was uh, to see how that um, river island would um, help, to, would start to restore itself if we gave it a little bit of a nudge. Uh, so what we did, is um, we lowered um, the riverbank here, just on the left, as you can see, and just allowed that water out of the main channel of the river um, just to flood over its uh, natural floodplain of where it would have been allowed um, were it not restrained in the past. And what we're seeing is really exciting. Um, so as a result of this work, we're now seeing uh, changes in the deposition patterns of the sediment across the floodplain as the floodwaters come in each time and then um, every time they move away again the, the structures change slightly and you're starting to see the river take control of its own course again so yeah really fantastic stuff uh, just um, just as a reference point that was uh, 2017 that that work was done so um, we're not just thinking about the um, river itself, um, but we're thinking about its connection uh, with its wider floodplain. So that's all the different pools, lakes, scrapes, wetlands, wet woodlands, um, marshes, fens, all sorts of different wetland habitats that provide that connectivity um, uh, within, within the wider floodplain there. They're not all, not all of them are necessarily directly influenced by the river itself, but they do have an influence um, on the wildlife um, that, that, that survives in them. So they provide that, those important stepping stones, um, um, providing uh, wetland habitats across the whole area. Um, these pictures here are um, South Elford. Um, the mineral uh, restoration plans uh, allowed us to um, recreate, uh, these are actually lakes, it's, a, it's like a, a big lake that you can see, but rather than having your typical um, rectangular steep-sided lake that you, you 
you historically might have seen out of some of uh, the, the, the restoration plans associated with uh, worked mineral sites, um, that the, the, they took the opportunity to create some real kind of diversity of habitats here. So you've got shallow margins here, you've got wet woodland, you've got backwaters created and areas coming out, extending into the lakes itself. So really creating those different niches allowing different types of wildlife to, to survive there. Um, so it's that variability that really is important that we're looking for. About 15 minutes, Victoria. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get a wiggle on then. So, <laughs> okay, so again, looking at the wider floodplain, these are some of the features um, that um, we, we want to make sure that you've got those stepping stones. Um, so you've got natural ponds. Um, a lot of ponds um, have been lost uh, from um, filled in by uh, farming activity and that sort of thing. So if we can work with uh, people such as the mineral uh, companies to put those ponds back into their restoration plans. Um, Oxbows, their um, former bends on the, on the river itself that have been cut off from the main river and create like a, a curved pond. This one's actually a um, created one um, at Barton Quarry where it was uh, put in as part of the like part of the restoration plans there. And then you've got scrapes and lagoon type features uh, which are very, very shallow, um, take, uh, cut out of the landscape so they, um, they would uh, retain water for a brief period after flooding, um, just providing Again, that's that stepping stone or that connectivity of wetland feature. Um, looking at um, protecting uh, species such as great crested newts, dragonflies and grass snakes and um, lots more. Um, just a, a, an overview picture of those oxbows that we just mentioned at Barton Quarry there. Ooh, sorry. Um, again, more features in the wider floodplain, some that you don't always think of um, as being necessarily uh, floodplain features, but bare ground and exposed cliffs, um, absolutely crucial for many invertebrates such as solitary nesting um, wasps and bees. Um, uh, and these kind of backwaters uh, are where you uh, might find things like uh, water bowls coming back in. Um, so yeah, all of those, those habitats in the wider floodplain should not be ignored. This is a photograph of the um, Dove Cliff Weir. Um, so it's on the River Dove. Um, it's um, a weir that's been, it, uh, the, the Environment Agency have um, been uh, removing it, uh, um, in the process of removing it over the last couple of years or so. Um, and I think the final removal is just coming out at the end of this month. Um, so this is one of the widest um, weir removals that's been planned in the UK to date. Um, it's, uh, weirs themselves are really important to consider taking out of the rivers as one of our first actions. Uh, they, uh, they restrict to some degree the movement of um, fish and invertebrates up, up the river. Um, so removing that restriction uh, uh, restores that connectivity along the watercourse. And by removing this Dove Cliff Weir, um, this is quoted as um, 30 miles of connectivity restored along the River Dove. So a, a massive, um, a massive beach really. Um, and, and that connection has um, restored from the River Dove uh, right to the confluence with the River Trent. So you, you've got that connectivity um, back in there. So um, on to one of the projects that um, has been delivered in 2020 um, as part of the Living Floodplains project um, is uh, the restoration of what we call a, a paleo channel, which is a historical river channel um, on the River Trent. So this is quite a nice resource here. It's called 
um, side by side maps and it's on the National Library of Scotland. So it's available um, for anyone to go and look at. Um, but what we've got here is a map dating back to the 1900s. And um, you can just see this channel here uh, forming this island, or a, a historical river island called Cherry Home. Um, so it's just noted there, Cherry Home. And um, there was formerly, uh, the River Trent was bifurcated or split into two channels at that point. And this project was um, an aim to restore that channel back here in, um, as you can see in this aerial photograph, that's where we wanted to put the new channel in. So the restoration work started back in 2013. Um, this picture here is where the formal channel would have been. Um, we think um, it was probably infilled as part of um, the, uh, the, the, the oh, what's it called? Oh, it was the river, river engineering project, sorry, in the 1960s. So when the rivers were dredged, in the in the 1960s, then the 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 spoil that came out of the rivers uh, went to infill this channel um, to to so that the the river could be deepened and um, uh, widened. Um, so yeah, that's that's what why the channel no longer existed. So initially in 2013, we we put the first part of the channel back. So it wasn't the entire channel; it was just what we call a backwater, um, which is um, uh, a channel uh, or rather a area of um, slow moving water off the uh, main river itself, um, but it didn't go all the way around the island at this point. Um, uh, and you can see here, we've put in several mounds of earth in the channel and stuck in, these are live willows, live willow trees, so that we can create wet woodland habitat. Uh, these pictures on your right, um, this is taken early this year in 2021 of, of this same area. And this one um, is in the summer of 2019. I know it looks a little bit more vegetated, but that's just due to the season being summer, whereas this one being in spring. But you can really see that you've now got some fabulous wet woodland habitat coming through there into that channel. Um, so in 2020, our aim was to restore the final connection to that river channel so that it would completely run around the island and you would have um, the river island again. So um, that river island is um, just over nearly nine hectares, 8.8 8 hectares in size, um, as we think one of the largest uh, river island restoration projects in the UK. So. So it's, it's pretty impressive, really. Um, again, the pictures are showing before, during, and nearly um, at the end, a couple of days before the, the final restoration of the channel was completed there. So I've just got a couple of videos here, which I'll talk you through. Um, So here you can see an aerial photography of this new channel that we created in 2020. We've put in some gravel features. So where you would see riffles and bars normally forming on a channel, we've put those in there. Uh, that's forward access to the island for the landowner. And um, there we've got a gravel island with a uh, living willow um, planted in it um, to stabilize that island again before it reconnects with the work that was done in 2013. Yeah. And another one. Here again, it really gives you an idea where you've got this aerial photography um, over here, this drone flyover. Before, you can't really see the channel at all. During, we tried to create a really shallow profile of the channel here, so it would it would make sure that when it was flooding, it would connect back with its wider floodplain. Um, and this is just again two days before the, the channel was opened up to the um, river River Trent. Um, again, these these gravel features eventually uh, becoming um, submerged under the water there. 
And lastly, this video here um, was an important moment for us because it shows uh, that reconnection point with the River Trent when we let the water go back all around the island again. So uh, proud moment for us. Okay, so moving on then, um, we talked about the importance of um, monitoring what we're doing. So this is some of the monitoring that has been going on. Um, what you're seeing here is aerial photography or ortho photography, um, as it's called. Um, it's, um, so you've got the aerial photography um, overlay, uh, underlaid, sorry, here, and then overlaid is new um, imagery that we've had created showing the new channel just coming around here, right the way around um, the island. Um, this was done using a drone um, flying over to get, to get this. And the important thing about this is it's so detailed that when we load it into our computer um, systems, we can zoom right in and you can pick out a pebble or a boulder on this uh, beach area here, say the size of a, a, a large baked potato or something like that and you can pick that right out and you can see if that's moved um, if you then go back and do some more photography six months later. So what we're try really trying to see here is um, we we're trying to monitor that, that channel to see whether any of um, the, it's restored any of the natural processes here um, in the river itself and we'll just keep an eye on it to make sure it's behaving as and how we expect it to. So that's it's pretty fantastic that we can look at it like that. This again, uh, this is the digital terrain model. So if you remember, we looked at something similar for Croxall earlier. Um, so the bits in red um, are trees that you can see on the island, and then you've got grassland, and then the, the dark blue is where the water is coming um, through the channel there. Uh, this is pretty cool. Um, we can uh, put this into our system and we can take a section across um, the, the, the new channel there and it will show the, the, the profile or the shape of the new uh, water course that's been created and then we can then um, predict how that uh, or put it run it through a model and predict how that's going to behave in different uh, flood events for example and we can check to see if that section changes when we go and do another um, uh, digital terrain model in the future as well. So yeah, that's uh, some really fab stuff that we can do there. Um, also, we want to get um, some monitoring for the actual new channel itself. So this is pretty soon after it was completed. Um, we're going in there to do some um, uh, macro invertebrate surveys in spring this year, um, just to get an idea of what baseline conditions are like or what it is before, before it really um, has a lot coming and colonizing it. Um, so you've got here a banded demoiselle that we found um, and there were quite a few mayfly larvae also that we found. Um, we haven't completed analyzing that sample yet but it should have some more interesting things in it and we hope to see lots more coming in over time. Um, finally, um, this, this project being still live, I uh, just want to uh, thank um, and acknowledge our key funders and partners. So quite a lot of people um, have been involved with um, the restoration at Cherry Home. But I'd like to acknowledge the, um, the, 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 the many different partners and funders that have gone into um, all the other projects that we've mentioned here this evening as well. Um, there's just far too many to mention, but over the years, um, so many people, um, so many different organisations have put into these projects and um, we really appreciate that. Uh, over to you, Nick.
if uh, that's okay. That's all right. So these restoration sites, um, they're, they're effectively outdoor laboratories and it gives us an opportunity to work with a series of schools, colleges, universities, community groups that, that become citizen scientists. So uh, just a point I wanted to make towards the end of the talk. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide. So just a, a couple of thoughts about the future. We would love to, as ecologists, we, we need to do a lot more um, river restoration. We need to keep transforming the trends. We need to kickstart the mini Mississippi as much as, much as we can. Um, looking back, it has changed an awful lot in the last 25 years. What's it gonna look like in 2050? Um, you know, it could be that we, we uh, start to see the management of the, the wider floodplain is much more extensive. So you could have things like large herbivores, water buffalo, as you can see here. Um, you could have um, Exmoor ponies, deer, all sorts of things that are wandering around in the floodplain as well. Excitingly, we could see the return of iconic species to actually breed and stay. So things like ospreys and uh, bitterns and beavers. Um, there's a, an awful lot to talk about on, on those species, but when you do have these iconic species, that in turn can actually make it more of a destination for people to come and enjoy and relax and, and really um, you know, appreciate what's going on in, in these floodplains. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Victoria. Thank you, Nick. Perfect timing. Um, so, yeah, we've just hit eight o'clock, so perfect timing there. We have got one or two questions in the chat. Um, what we'll do is we'll just take a, a five minute break, um, come back in five minutes and we'll just go through those questions. And then if you've got anything else you want to discuss or maybe that Victoria or Nick have got something that they might want to expand upon a bit further, um, we can do that as well. So if we take a five minute break for now and then we'll come back in five. OK.